Corrosion Part 7. Hello everyone, welcome to Corrosion Audio Lecture 7, Further Localised Corrosion Phenomena, uh, in which we will finish off looking at the real-world corrosion processes in Chapter 4 of the handout. Let's start with a photograph, looking at the first of the corrosion phenomena I want to look at this time. This photograph shows a structural failure, a building collapse, in which the reinforced concrete roof over a heated indoor swimming pool has collapsed. Actually, there were quite a few of these failures back in the 1980s, uh, but they were not failures of things built in the 80s, they were failures of things built in the 1960s and 70s, uh, back when architects were mad keen on using reinforced concrete for everything. Uh, they would even say to themselves, well, what kind of municipal swimming pool shall we build? And then the other architects there would answer, oh, I imagine that people would love to uh, go swimming inside some sort of reinforced concrete shell, and then they can admire the brutalist concrete architecture of the roof while they're swimming, if they're swimming on their backs. So the architects thought along these lines, and they justified to themselves building using reinforced concrete. And they then said, Haha, we are no fools, we clever architects of the 1960s and 70s. That's what they thought. And they said, Reinforced concrete, of course, being heavy, needs to be supported with reinforcing bars. And they said, we're actually even cleverer than that, because we realise we're building a concrete roof over a heated indoor swimming pool. That's a location with a humid atmosphere, a humid atmosphere that potentially contains chlorine, so it's maybe quite a corrosive pl place. So therefore they said, the reinforcing bars we shall use to hold up our concrete roof uh, shall be made of stainless steel. And at this point they declared themselves happy, and they went ahead with their design. Uh, Twenty or so years later, a number of these collapsed because the reinforcing bars, which they had chosen sensibly at the time to be strong enough to hold up the roof, and somewhat corrosion resistant, turned out not to be resistant to a kind of corrosion they weren't expecting, called stress corrosion cracking, which is what we'll look at in section 4.8. Okay, so stress corrosion cracking and a associated mechanism, somewhat similar, corrosion fatigue, are mechanisms which can cause unexpected brittle failure of structures and pressure vessels, after potentially a quite long time in service, there are two distinct kinds of ways we worry about this problem happening. So first of all, stress corrosion cracking is a risk for metals which experience a constant tensile stress in a corrosive environment. So for example, the stainless steel structural reinforcing bars were experiencing a constant tensile stress for holding up some kind of load. In many bridges, there are also uh, structural elements under a constant tensile stress. Some pressure vessels, which contain permanently a high pressure, might also have a constant tensile stress in the metal. The second case we're interested in is corrosion fatigue, which is relevant to cases where we have a varying tensile stress, a cyclic stress, for example, affecting some structural metal element in a corrosive environment. So this might happen if you have a pressure vessel which is uh, frequently filled and emptied during cycles. In that case, we can have additional mechanisms beyond the ones we worry about in the constant tensile stress case, uh, which might lead to brittle failure. Okay, In section 4.8.1, let's introduce a very simple brittle failure mechanism. So in other courses in chemical engineering, you might come across detailed stress analysis and pressure vessel criteria for brittle failure. You might come across the Tresca or von Mises criterion for failure. In this course, we just want to use a very simple model because we're not so much worried about the details of stresses. We just want an approximate equation to indicate if brittle failure is a risk. So let's just talk about equation 4.5, which is simply the stress intensity factor K applied, which is 
results from a simple tension load, for example, in a reinforcing bar which is holding up a load. So this stress intensity factor is some geometric constant alpha, probably call it 1 maybe, times the applied tensile stress times this root of pi a, where a is the surface crack depth. And if the stress intensity factor applied to some structural element is greater than the fracture toughness of the material, then we expect brittle failure to happen. Now, equation 4.5 is good enough for us to identify two reasons why corrosion might lead to brittle failure that you would not expect from purely a mechanical engineering perspective. Reason one is if corrosion causes the fracture toughness of the material to decrease, and reason two is if corrosion causes the surface crack depth to increase. Uh, we can assume that the maximum applied stress sigma that we need to worry about is known for the design, and so we only need to think about the fracture toughness and the crack depth. It's pretty easy to think about why corrosion might cause a decrease in fracture toughness. The argument is simply that when a piece of metal stays stainless steel is in a corrosive environment, its surface might really be an oxide or some other corrosion product. So any brittle failure by crack growth that does happen is going to involve crack growth not through the pure metal, which probably has an ex excellent fracture toughness, instead it's going to involve crack growth through a surface layer which involves some oxide which is probably much more brittle and underneath that oxide there might still be some metal providing some residual strength. So this means that 10 or 20 years of corrosion might result in a decreased fracture toughness of the metal. So instead of having some known value for a new material, a new item which you could look up in a table as KIC, the critical stress intensity factor, we might have to look up a tested value for similar components after exposure to their expected environment for say 10 or 20 years and we'd have to look up instead this KISCC, the fracture toughness after whatever corrosion has been observed to happen on a similar previous product. And this uh, corroded stress of fracture toughness is probably going to be much worse than the fracture toughness of the material as it was produced. Now as well as the decrease in fracture toughness it's also pretty easy to see why corrosion might lead to growth of cracks. The classic corrosion mechanism which causes crack growth is pitting corrosion which is quite common especially for the kinds of uh, structural metals which might be passive like aluminium or stainless steel uh, that you might be worrying about. Okay, so those are the two mechanisms which uh, you need to worry about for stress corrosion cracking. And if we have, instead of the stress corrosion cracking under a constant tensile stress, if instead we're worrying about corrosion fatigue under a varying tensile stress, uh, then we have one more mechanism to worry about, which is crack growth because of stress cycling. The idea here is that if you have a oscillating tension in some material, then each cycle, each time the material is loaded to a high tension, this will potentially cause a very small amount of additional cracking through the extremely thin oxide which is uh, existing at the crack tip. Now, the mechanism for this, well, the mechanism to describe this is proposed as this Paris's law model. Uh, so it just says dA by dN, so the crack length change dA for every stress cycle, so an increase in N, is just some constant times the change in K, the change in stress intensity of factor during the stress cycle, uh, raised to some uh, empirically determined parameter N. So this is a, a correlation, so we can use this equation to model how, what is the speed of crack growth uh, per cycle. And this is important if we, first of all, if we determined that straightforward overload according to equation 4.5 is not a problem. And if we then also find that failure because of 
overload at the decreased fracture toughness relevant for stress corrosion cracking is also not a problem, then we would only be worried about brittle failure if there was some crack growth, which could happen because of this varying applied stress. So on this uh, uh, page 10, we have a diagram showing regions on a log-log diagram of stress against floor size where the different corrosion failure mechanisms are expected. So straightforward overload at high stress, which we could expect from mechanical engineering without knowing about corrosion science. This uh, stress corrosion cracking in this intermediate region where we're worried about decreased fracture toughness and probably the value of the crack size A which we're worrying about might be bigger if we think that some pitting corrosion might be uh, might have happened that's something we would need to have measured for test components and then corrosion fatigue for any lower stresses might be a problem but only if there is a varying applied tensile stress Section 4.8.4 just uses some comments about how to protect against brittle failure in corrosion. Uh, one option is simply to use thicker materials to ensure lower stress. This gets you out of the overload regime and it means that your crack growth per stress cycle if you have corrosion fatigue like in equation 4.6, your crack growth will be small if your material is experiencing a lower stress change. We could also use materials which have been tested and which there's, it's known from tables of data that they deteriorate slowly. These might be high chromium alloys, for example, but it would have to be looked up in a table. It's also important to have inspection and replacement, uh, for example, of components in bridges. And it's also a possibility to look at coatings or anodic protection. Uh, if you look, for example, at the excellent Brooklyn Bridge, you might find that the uh, the steel cables which hold it up are well coated with a nice zinc containing paint uh, which provides uh, good protection from corrosion. Uh, one final comment, the swimming pool example which we looked at earlier, uh, this is a older kind of architecture back when people decided that heavy reinforced concrete was a fantastic building material. In the 21st century, you will much more commonly find uh, buildings put together out of beautiful wood, which, as it happens, is a perfect way of avoiding stress corrosion cracking, causing failure of steel elements, both because your wooden elements are going to be much lighter and not being thermodynamically unstable metals. They simply aren't so badly affected by corrosion. Section 4.9 is on hydrogen damage, a collection of several related mechanisms which are very serious in the process industries, especially the oil and gas industries. In fact, these mechanisms are so commonly blamed for deterioration that they might sometimes be blamed by default if there's simply no evidence that some other problem is responsible for a failure. But nonetheless, that's partly because they are of very wide importance and severity. So why is hydrogen a particular problem for corrosion? It comes down to two of the properties of elemental hydrogen, which are first of all that it's extremely common being present uh, in acid or in hydrocarbon streams or even anywhere that moisture is present. There will probably be some hydrogen atoms available. Second, hydrogen is an unusually small atom, so it's able to diffuse through solid metals in a way that other gases simply do not. When taken together, this means that hydrogen is able to get to a lot of places uh, where it can cause chemical problems and deterioration of a metal. Uh, there are several different mechanisms uh, by which hydrogen damage can happen. So, the first one we'll talk about is hydride formation. So it turns out that lots of alloys, especially high performance alloys, contain components, trace components like titanium, vanadium, niobium, or other metals which are actually quite reactive hydride formers. 
So within a particular stainless steel that has these, you might normally think that corrosion is not a problem because your stainless steel has its 18% chromium and therefore it forms a passive surface oxide and therefore active corrosion is not going to be a problem because the water is not going to be able to get into the material. It will be sealed away by the nice protective passive film on the metal surface. That's generally a good description of what happens on your stainless steel, but hydrogen being able to diffuse through solid metals and through oxide layers as well is able to get into these alloys. And when it does so, it combines with the reactive metals like say titanium and it forms titanium hydride. This is a double problem. First of all, the titanium hydrides or the other reactive metal hydrides are themselves very brittle phases which make the bulk alloy material more vulnerable to cracking. We say overall the fracture toughness of the alloy is going to decrease. Second, these expensive reactive metal components in the alloy were probably there for a reason. It was probably meant, for example, that they should be well dispersed throughout the alloy phase and that if they were then they should provide some useful property like increased yield stress. Whatever useful property your alloy components were meant to provide once they were in the alloy, they're not going to do that if they've been taken out to form hydrides. So some kind of loss of properties, often yield stress, were going to be caused by hydride formation, that part of hydrogen damage. A second hydrogen damage mechanism is decarburization. So this is something which happens at high temperatures. It could be relevant to, for example, alloys used to provide pipelines for high temperature gases coming out of the ground as a hydrocarbon stream in gas extraction, or any other kind of high temperature stream containing uh, hydrocarbons, which will tend to have some hydrogen uh, in the stream. So in this case, the problem is that dissolved hydrogen atoms inside the alloy react with carbon. And if your alloy is steel, it, I'm assuming your alloy is steel, the hydrogen reacts with dissolved carbon. It forms methane, and this is also a double problem. It causes a loss of strength because it removes carbon, which was probably well dissolved throughout the steel, providing increased yield stress. So removing carbon drops the yield stress and producing the pro reaction product methane means that you probably have a buildup of gas internal to the alloy. And this can be a gas in a very small volume in an internal void in the alloy. It can produce high pressures, which can lead to the third problem in hydrogen damage, which is hydrogen blistering. So a hydrogen blister is a void defect that has been stretched open and it's caused macroscopic internal damage within the alloy. This might happen because of production of methane as just discussed, so you get high pressure gas which expands inside the alloy. It can also happen if hydrogen gas itself is produced inside internal to the alloy. Uh, that might happen under some cathodic protection mechanisms. You might have a sacrificial anode somewhere which is dissolving and it might be causing normally you might think it's just preventing your main alloy say your iron in your steel from dissolving but your say sacrificial zinc anode might also be causing some hydrogen evolution reaction to take place usually you'd think of that taking place on the surface of the alloy but it could also take place by hydrogen evil hydrogen gas evolution from dissolved hydrogen that's interior to the alloy and that might take place within an internal void or defect. You might then have a build-up of these high pressure small pockets of gas within the alloy which can expand or just create internal stresses which cause the formation of these blisters. Now this can cause then catastrophic bulk mechanical damage to your alloy component. Okay, that's just a quick survey of hydrogen damage mechanisms. Quite a lot more is written on the subject that you can read about in the textbooks. Uh, but let's carry on with a quick survey. Let's talk about preventing hydrogen damage. Okay, so 
Uh, there's the trivial method. Uh, avoid unintentionally producing or having hydrogen present. So if, for example, you have a method, a metal which is being cathodically protected, then don't cathodically protect it by such a strong polarization that lots of hydrogen is produced. Use a minimal amount of cathodic protection to prevent the dissolution of, say, the iron. Uh, what else could we do? Well, if hydrogen is not needed within a reaction stream, then you should probably uh, avoid having it present. So you shouldn't unnecessarily involve acids which should have been neutralized earlier in a process. What else can we do? Let's now assume that hydrogen does have to be present. Something we can do is we can do some work with alloy choice. We can choose austenitic stainless steels, or we can look in a table and we can find out which stainless steels are more resistant to hydrogen damage. It is often said that austenitic stainless steels are more resistant, partly because they're less brittle than, say, ferritic stainless steels. Yeah, this on a material science point of view is because the face-centred cubic austenitic stainless steel crystal structure possesses more slip planes than the more brittle uh, body-centred cubic ferritic stainless steel lattice. But another reason is that there is simply lower hydrogen atom diffusivity in the denser austenitic stainless steel crystal structure. With lower hydrogen atom diffusivity, uh, this means the hydrogen simply doesn't get where it's going uh, as quickly and the damage mechanism is not going to be as rapid. As well as that, if we want to slow down hydrogen diffusion in a metal, we can uh, hope that it might be possible to work at lower temperature. So high temperature promotes fast hydrogen diffusion and hence faster damage. So if we can arrange for a stream to be cooled down as early as conveniently possible, that means that the cooler stream further down in the process uh, won't be suffering such a rapid hydrogen damage. So low temperatures are potentially good because they cut down hydrogen diffusion speed. Actually, very high temperatures have a certain amount of advantage as well. Above about 150 Celsius, there is a good driving force for hydrogen to come out of solution if it was dissolved into a metal. So imagine we have manufactured some stainless steel alloy, and we've cleaned it off with acid, and we've done some treatment to the surface, and we think this acid treatment might have left some residual hydrogen dissolved inside the alloy. Well, if, the, if we want to remove this internal hydrogen, one thing we can do before we put our stainless steel component into surface is to nicely anneal it, driving the outgassing of hydrogen and so that once it's in surface, it won't have internal hydrogen which could cause uh, gradually hydrogen damage to take place. Obviously, this is a good way to remove internal hydrogen that was added during the manufacture of a component, but it's no use for removing external hydrogen that is expected to be added to the alloy in service if the alloy is in contact with a hydrocarbon stream or an aqueous environment. Section 4.10 on the damage caused by expanding corrosion products is about a failure mechanism which is important in many situations of which hydrogen damage is actually one specific case. So when the hydride formation took place in some stainless steel alloys, for example, because of titanium forming titanium hydride, there is often not just a deterioration of properties, a worsening of yield stress and fracture toughness. The new phase which is produced is often larger in volume than the metal which it formed from. And this actually produces internal stresses in the mechanism which contribute to the blistering and other hydrogen damage phenomena. But the fact that a corrosion product often expands, creates internal stresses in a material, and then causes a cracking or other failure, or at least a worsening of resistance to further stresses, uh, this phenomenon applies to a lot more things than just hydrogen damage. Uh, there's a picture here of some concrete floor which has cracked because of the expansion of a metal grate. Now, the metal grate, I cannot personally guarantee that the expansion of this metal grate was caused by the expansion of corrosion products produced by the weathering steel, uh, but that would 
be a common phenomenon which might cause this kind of cracking of the surrounding matrix material. In this case, I do wonder whether it might just be thermal cycling has caused the expansion of the metal and cracking of the cement. But it is a picture which looks a lot like what you would frequently expect to happen in corrosion. Um, a particular important case is aluminium aircraft. So in modern aluminium aircraft, we often have sheets of aluminium which can delaminate. And that happens if you have corrosion layers build up in between the aluminium sheets. Your hydrated aluminium oxide corrosion product, if it can form, has a much larger volume than the initial metal. So it produces tensile stresses within, for example, rivets that hold the aluminium sheets together. Uh, this can lead to failure of the outside of an aircraft, and it's something which is looked for during maintenance and is important to spot. Okay, good. So we've looked now through several localised corrosion phenomena. There are more that we could find in textbooks. If this was a longer course, I would talk about uh, biofouling, I would talk about microbial induced corrosion. Uh, I would also talk in much more detail about rust as a specific process, uh, as opposed to just giving you a very brief description, which I did in chapter one. Uh, but for this course, uh, this we've looked at now quite a lot of real world corrosion phenomena, and certainly pitting corrosion, crevice corrosion, stress corrosion cracking are among the most important that you need to know about in practice. So what we'll go on to do in the next lecture is to look at real-world corrosion protection mechanisms, uh, which we will do with a particular emphasis on treating the real-world corrosion phenomena we saw in these lectures on localised corrosion, and we'll also look at corrosion protection in light of the electrochemical models we looked at in chapters 2 and 3. So that uh, corrosion protection is what we will get to looking at in the future.